Just state your name and uh, My name is uh, Dwayne O'Dell. I'm with West Virginia Farm Bureau as uh, Director of Government uh, Operations, I guess you'd say. And I do appreciate, Mr. Chairman, the opportunity to be here to express the Farm Bureau's position on a number of issues that have come up. Uh, members of the committee, uh, we, we applaud your efforts to try to uh, improve state government and to make it more efficient. And may I say unto you, that's our only purpose here in bringing these issues before you today. We need and want a successful Department of Agriculture. They are important to our West Virginia farmers. They're important to our consumers as they are one of the lead agencies responsible for a safe food supply that is important to all folks. That said, we have two or three issues that we'd like to present before the committee so that they can be reviewed. Uh, number one, we our members, by the way, we have over 20,000 members scattered around the state have expressed concern that the Department of Agriculture is using tax dollars to compete against other farmers by some of the programs. In particular, the purchase of four uh, flush cows to the tune of $33,000. Uh, the accusation is that those cows could have been purchased in West Virginia uh, by, from our very competent producers here. We have well over 12,000 beef cattle producers in this state well over 200 various purebred breeders who could have supplied uh, flush cows for this particular program. Our understanding is that it was not offered to West Virginia producers, but was uh, authorized under, we believe, sole source funding to purchase those cows from a farm in Oklahoma. Uh, we, uh, the, the beef cattle business is strong in West Virginia. Annual sales of 120 to 180 million dollars a year. Uh, it uh, provides nearly 25% of the entire uh, income, agricultural income in our whole state. Economists have clearly identified that that money stays in our local communities and reverberates through those communities at the tune of seven or eight times before it passes out of the community. Very important economic driver in our state. We say, we believe at the Farm Bureau that one of the methods that we could use in this state in improving our economy would be to take a serious look at programs that would facilitate uh, development and further develop our agricultural opportunities and our resources. We do not believe that it's the job of state government or the Department of Agriculture to take money and make it compete against our West Virginia farmers. Additionally, we would ask that the commissioner just stay within the code as it's outlined, primarily if you review chapter 19 of the code, you will see that that code identifies primarily 75 to 80 percent of his responsibility is regulatory in nature to ensure that we have a safe food supply. The remainder portion of, the, of chapter 19 deals with licensing and uh, some marketing activities. So we believe those are things that, that are imperative that the department fulfill their responsibilities. In addition to the purchase of the cows, I guess this is the one that uh, the purchase of those cows made our telephone start ringing, uh, brought about other information that was made available to us from varying sources, and uh, we have no way in Farm Bureau to validate those accusations. Uh, I, I will tell you this, I have somewhat of a long background in state government. I also work for the Department of Agriculture. I'm a former vocational agriculture teacher. I've got a master's degree in agriculture. Uh, the old saying is, I've been around the region back. Uh, so I've seen a number of things, and I give you that information because the reports indicate that there are a number of, of projects scattered around the state involving the production, the actual production of potatoes. Uh, let me back up. I, I must say that we admire uh, the new administration uh, with the West Virginia Department of Agriculture for their efforts in trying to, quote, improve agriculture. However, we believe there's been some misguided steps that compete with farmers and also does not use scientific data in their decision-making process and fail to, uh, to properly uh, enact the programs that they have proposed. The potatoes is certainly one of them. The accusation has been made that well over a million, if not a million five, dollars have been invested in a program over the last three years. Uh, cost of production on those potatoes are extremely high, nearly a, do a dollar per pound based upon uh, information reported by the Soil Conservation Society. 
May I say unto you, agriculture has changed tremendously in America over the last 30 or 40 years. If you look back uh, to uh, the 1970s, there were well over 50,000 commercial potato producers in America. Today, there's only 15,000 commercial potato producers in America. Extremely competitive business. Uh, we believe that this is a misguided effort. We have what we have is a government-run program that is artificializing uh, the real market conditions in the potato business. For example, this program buys all the seed, all the fertilizer, all the input ingredients, and give that to a prospective client, whether that be a veteran or someone who's just beginning to learn how to get into the farming business. And, and in fact, we believe they are setting these individuals up for the fall. I'd really like to have the government come by and buy all my necessary needs to be able to stay in the beef cow business. We believe that these are artificialized programs. When you don't have any skin in the game, often it fails or implodes. By the way, the state has had a long history of starting some of these types of programs. Some of you have been here longer than I have, but if you'll think back to the uh, fish investment that we made a number of years ago, spent millions of dollars at the same time that we were investing millions of dollars, there were ponds that were being drained in the state of Mississippi. Folks, all we're asking for is a reasonable scientific approach to the programs that we finance. It must have a solid business program uh, behind that. And it appears that uh, that has not been done. Let me also suggest to you that there's been other monies that have been spent that we believe that are uh, uh, of somewhat uh, uh, questionable nature. We, we are concerned about uh, reports that there was a green bean, quote, a green bean project where uh, an individual farmer raised green beans. They were supposed to be marketed in tr under traditional methodology to a broker. Uh, by the way, that's a pretty good program. But the problem was that uh, the beans were allowed to mature. They were not able to be marketed. In fact, they were, they were supposed to, as a secondary backup plan, the beans were supposed to be given to the uh, Department of Corrections. By the way, in the code, the Department of Agriculture has responsibility to provide the necessary food for uh, the uh, correctional services. That was established under the West Virginia Farm Management Commission originally in 1976 and later transferred to the department in the mid-1990s. May I say unto you, those green beans were so bad that they were rejected. Now let's face it, not every farmer gets every cow bred. Not every farmer has a record yield. We recognize that there could be some difficult times but we believe a number of these projects, not only the Green Bean Project, but the Walnut Project, uh, the High Tunnel Project is one of the more successful ones. All we're asking state government to do is to take a good, close look at how the dollars are being spent, where they're being spent, and, and have a clear view of why they are being spent. In closing, I would ask, we would ask from the Farm Bureau's standpoint that all the expenditures regarding the so-called pilot projects be reviewed. And we fear that this program has become a spend, S-P-E-N-D, and spin, S-P-I-N, project. We want real business plans. We want our tax dollars used uh, carefully and uh, appropriately. And we believe that uh, we would applaud the efforts of state government to, to ensure that. Let's stop taking tax dollars and competing against our West Virginia farmers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. We really appreciate that. As prerogative for the chair, I'm going to allow a few questions to you, and then we'll call on uh, uh, Mr. Teats for his presentation. And, uh, you'll take a few questions, and then we'll allow questions of either uh, presenter. So yes. are there questions for Mr. Odell at this point? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. you. You mentioned earlier that you think the potato program is setting some uh, new farmers up for the fall. Yes, I'm not sure I, I quite follow. Could you elaborate on that? Okay. One? The, uh, the business in West Virginia, if you're doing an excellent job of producing potatoes in West Virginia, uh, do all the spraying correctly, correct fertilization, you'll produce around 20,000 pounds per acre. Uh, and the department's cost uh, through the soil conservation, the reported cost, is nearly a dollar a pound. In Idaho, the potato business has centralized in a number of places. All of agriculture has centralized to where they are the most efficient. 
states of Maine, Wisconsin, and the northwest area of our country, Idaho and Washington, are the primary areas of potato production. Why? Their soil conditions and environmental conditions are such that they can produce upwards of 40,000 pounds per acre. Not always, but many times and routinely at 30,000 pounds per acre. Therefore, their production capability is a third greater than ours and their input costs are lower. I don't care if you're raising dairy cows or widgets or potatoes in this case, if your production costs are 30% greater than your competitors, you're set for the fall. We believe that this government program artificializes the, the real potato market for these beginning farmers, and in some cases, by the way, veterans uh, that are an important segment of our community are giving them a false hope. Uh, remember, this program provides 90 to 100 percent of the input costs. Let's say we were to stop that today. What would happen? They're going to have to come up with the remainder of the money. There's a, not a clear business program. They've tried violently at the, at the department to market the potatoes under a number of different mechanisms. Uh, and uh, we, we just believe that it's an incorrect expenditure of money. For example, $33,000 spent on those cows, delegate, would have financed well over 100 different training programs for 100 different veterans in the, uh, in the uh, uh, honey, and, uh, honey training program, if you will, that is also a pilot project with the department. Uh, where they would get honeybees and be able to have the proper training and have some understanding of how to uh, to raise that, that particular crop. So we believe there has to be a careful evaluation of these programs. I believe that some of the problems are, vet, are incorrect vetting of the projects and lack of technical support. Folks, agriculture is extremely technical today. Go and take a look at what a new combine costs. Uh, with using uh, GPS technology, it's much different than many of us were, that were raised back in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. It has changed significantly, significantly, so we're fearful that these government programs, which have had a long history of setting people up for the fall, they will implode once the money is pulled away. Let's step back and take a careful look up front before we invest. Thank you. Uh, I guess in the interest of time, and I will say also that the uh, osteopathic school presentation is scheduled uh, to be after this, and I really, if you're here for that presentation, I just don't think we're going to be able to get to that. So, uh, with, with just to make you aware of the, our timing issues. Uh, so, if I could call on Mr. Teets now for your presentation. Mr. Chairman, uh, we, we had two different gentlemen involved, uh, former delegate, Bob Tab and Teets. Okay. So you get a better uh, understanding of them. Okay. Well, you're both welcome to the podium. Mr. Chairman, committee, thank you all. Uh, just to clear things up, uh, former delegate Bob Tab has been working on me with this project, uh, the Donor Cow Project, and I will go into that. I'll give you a little bit of background on myself. I have been a farmer all my life uh, in beef cattle. We've done embryo work since uh, for the past 20 years. And through that program, you can enhance your herd uh, so much faster to bring better genetics in and to have better quality. And to go into the donor cows that, uh, that we purchased. The reason I purchased those cows from Express Ranches in Oklahoma is they are the top Angus breeders in the United States or in the world. They win about all the shows. They have phenotype, they have all the carcass data, you name it, and they have it in the Angus breed. And that's the reason those cows were purchased from there. We're not doing anything here to <coughs> compete uh, with the farmers in West Virginia. We just want to bring better genetics here. So if their children want to do strictly carcass, uh, data with those animals, that's fine. If they want to go in the show circuit, they'll have a phenotype there to do that, to win wherever they go. Uh, with that, we have a couple different programs that we were looking at. We thought we'd put some of these animals in the performance test here in the state, but we've got a feedback that some of the farmers feel that we would be competing with them in that program we just thought that some of the farmers may want to 
purchase a few of those animals to put back in their herds after they saw the data that would be presented. The other part of it is, and Mr. Ted here, we worked on this together, and if you don't mind, I'll let him explain what we're going to do with young people or people that are not farmers right now or veterans that would like to get into this program. Thank you. And uh, for the record, do you mind stating your name and position? Uh, I'm not sure. I I'm Mike Teach with Washington, uh, Director of Eastern Operations with the Department of Agriculture. Okay. And I'm, do the same. I'm Bob Tam. I'm Senior Manager with the West Virginia Department of Agriculture. And the part that uh, I'm going to speak on is we did have feedback of the, you know, the competitive nature of the testing programs. The one part that, uh, that we're looking at and think would be a great opportunity for agriculture in West Virginia is a lease program. And it would, you know, we don't have all the details worked out of it, uh, but basically for a dollar, people could lease peppers, lease bulls, and it would be an objective criteria of the people qualifying for it. Um, the points haven't all been assigned. We don't have all the list yet. We're open to suggestions. But the uh, things such as whether you're a veteran, whether you're a new farmer, small farmer, but one of the biggest single points that would, that would play into whether you would be eligible to lease one of these animals would be your location. We have so many areas in this state that are in such economic disarray that, you know, up where I'm from in Jefferson County, through this point system, there would be a very little likelihood every, anyone would ever get one of these animals in Jefferson County. But if you're in McDowell County, Wyoming County, Nicholas, Webster, those are the areas that are in such economic disarray and lack of opportunities that this would give something for the people. This isn't about competing. These people that would qualify for these animals aren't going to be people at the production sales. These are people that, that either just starting out small, trying to get going, and on the, on the bulls, an example on the bulls end of it. If someone has a small herd, they typically end up going to a stock sale to buy a cull animal for a bull because they can't afford to pay a lot of money for a bull to breed a few cows. Um, they can do AI, but a lot of them don't. But this program would, would give opportunities for an increase in the genetic pool, not saying that they're better than the rest of the cattle in West Virginia, but this would give some economic opportunity to areas in this state and give hope to people. We've done things with the potato program. We've done things with honeybees. We've done things with high tunnels. This is another part of that. In fact, one thing to go back to on the potatoes, this year is the first time in decades that the West Virginia Department of Agriculture does not have title ownership of potatoes in West Virginia. We are not growing potatoes in the department this year. The people are growing them. We're assisting them, but we are not growing. The potatoes for the um, prison system this year will come from private enterprise. They will come through us. But with the value-added system that's been put in and money spent, yes, there's been well over a million dollars spent. And most of that is in the equipment, the plant, harvest, and value-add package. We're going from wheelbarrows, forks, and burlap sacks to mechanical planters, mechanical harvesters, and a system that first is set up in Huntington that they bring the potatoes in. When they come out, they're in a bag. And those bags coming through there, they aren't the Department of Agriculture potatoes. They're that producer's potatoes. But these, you know, these are, are just opportunities. The, um, the one other thing I would like to clarify that, that was stated earlier, <coughs> in chapter 19 about the um, duties of the commissioner. Um, this is in chapter 19.14. Um, devised means of advancing the agricultural interests of the state and in the performance of such duty, he or she shall have the authority to call upon any state department or officer of the state or county to cooperate, make, to cooperate in promoting the agriculture interests of the state. Now a little further, it talks about the um, one of the duties is development of states' agricultural, horticultural, and kindred interests, especially in production, processing, market, and distribution. So it's all those things out there together. There's, there's been some um, you know, misinformation, I think, on, on some of these things of how some of these were done. 
there's specific, um, and we'll leave this here for the committee, but in the purchasing handbook, you know, number 19, Department of Agriculture exemptions. Approved exemptions for the West Virginia Department of Agriculture include purchase of livestock, the acquisition of bees for <coughs> population purposes, and commodity processing services for U.S. donated foods. These are in the state purchasing bulletin. So for somebody to make a claim that we're in violation of purchasing laws by doing this, they obviously didn't look at what, what's here. But I, I will leave these here for you, but we'd certainly be glad to answer any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Are there questions of our presenters from the committee? Uh, Senator Carr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm kind of curious on the um, lease program. Uh, I, there's been a point of order raised, and I'm, I'm not aware. Are, are you a member of the committee? Uh, uh, it was my understanding that the GATE and the uh, Joint Ag Committee were meeting jointly for the discussion of this. I was notified that way. So I'm, I'm not on the GATE Committee, but I am the chair of the Ag Committee. So I, I'm that's correct. Well, uh, with the leave of the committee, I would allow the question if there's uh, no objections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, um, uh, again, coming back to the question, uh, the lease program, you said you had totally worked out all the details in that? No. It's, I mean, it's a little ways off yet. There's, there's been press releases, accusations, uh, a lot of other things said in the media and news reports. Um, nobody's come to us, you know, to... Um, offer up any suggestions on this, but we, we are working on this and we'll be, you know, uh, very open and transparent of what's going to be in that program. The, the, uh, to me, the real, the real key is development in a manner that you take away all the names at the top when it comes time for selection, whether there's, you know, in any given year, say if there's, um, you know, 25 heifers available, 25 bulls available. It's strictly on points, but but the one focus that we've looked at and feel like is important is the the location of where these animals go would would have a higher point value than anything else in there. You know, if you're a veteran, if you're a new farmer, if you're a minority, there's a lot of there there would be numerous different categories that would qualify for varying amounts of points. But the one category, once you hit some of these other thresholds, the one category that would be have the most determination would be where you're located. Now, along with that, before you would even qualify for it, you know, you would have to show that you have capabilities to, um, you know, house livestock, that you will meet the livestock care standards, um, that you will have a plan with a veterinarian. I mean, we we've got some other things that you don't just get these animals handed to you. They'll be on lease, they'll be insured, you have to have a business plan, you have to have a, a veterinarian. Um, that was, you know, we want these people to understand, especially if they haven't raised livestock before, to understand what they're getting into. This isn't a 40-hour you know, week occupation, so um, but we're, we're more than open to other suggestions. But this is, this is no different than other programs throughout the state, especially targeting some of the areas where where there's just you know, just not much economic activity. And, and one thing, in areas where there's been a lot of reclamation, one of the first things you have in the process of reclamation is grass. Cows eat grass. So this, you know, you don't have to have bottom land to raise corn and soybeans and wheat as your protein source if you're going to do pasture, uh, you know, pasture raised cattle. But there's, uh, there's about half the number of the cattle in the state right now is what there was at the peak. As far as population of, of cattle in the state, so there's there's you a lot of area that they could grow. You intend to, char to charge these new farmers for the leases? Absolutely, a dollar. A dollar for the lease, okay. Um, and there, you insist that they have a, a business plan as well? There, there would be a plan that was of, of what um, you know what they intend to do. It's good. It would be a competitive. Um, but obviously, we wouldn't have enough to furnish livestock that possibly everyone. That would like to have some but it's um you know the, the, the program would seek out individuals um to apply and the, the the awards would be made based on points it wouldn't be made who you are but the the location of where you are would have a fairly significant impact on where these animals would would go it 
And it would vary possibly from year to year. There wasn't as many people applied for it. It would take less points to receive an animal. Um, you know, the, the more well, points people. The reason I was asking that actually in part was because if I gathered correctly, uh, you know, one of the concerns that was raised by Mr. Odell was that there didn't seem to be a plan. A lot of times it was more like throw money at things. And, and, and then I hear you say that you're going to require them to have a plan, but you don't, by what you've said here, have a plan yourself. Uh, so it seems to feed nobody. back into what Mr. Odell was saying that this stuff is being thrown out here with no real business plan. With, with all the press conferences and news things that have been done, no one, to my knowledge, has contacted us to see what our plan is. There was a bunch you just of said a few minutes ago that you don't have a plan. We do have a plan. We're working on the plan. Um, another question I have is related to the, the genetics, because that's an important thing with uh, breeding animals. What particular genetic lines did you bring into the state that uh, aren't here yet? I, I don't have those. Uh, I don't have all the uh, records in front of me. Uh, we do have them on record. I could get those to you. You have all of them. These I just are, have the one. You just have the one. Is there a reason why you just have this one? Or? The American Angus Association hasn't posted the other three. We don't want to start a dialogue without it being recorded. So, uh, but Senator Carnes is recognized for questions at the moment. Okay. Well, I think what I looked at when I purchased these cows, Senator Carnes, was the uh, the beef, the dollar beef value on them, and on this on this animal here, it's a hundred thirty nine eighty. Uh, you look at her milk and her weight weight. All those numbers on here, that's what I looked at when I purchased these. Are there no cows or stock in West Virginia that have similar numbers that you could have purchased this? Uh, I'm not kidding. And, and if you would speak into the microphone, sorry. I, re I really can't answer that. I don't know if there's any cows, any cows uh, here in the state that would have the same numbers that this cow did. I just know that when I bought these cows, we went strictly by the numbers that was presented that day. But, uh, it, it seems like it's a little bit mixed because a little while ago you said you wanted to bring uh, you know, some, some lines into West Virginia that weren't here. Um, but what you're talking about is not genetic lines. You're talking about weights associated with- Well, no, that all goes back to genetics. But I, I understand it all goes back to genetics. So my question is, you said that you were bringing something into West Virginia that's not here. Presumably that would be related to the genetic lines of the animals, but now you've said that, in fact, it didn't have anything to do with the genetic lines, it only had to do with the weights. But then we don't know that there isn't plenty of sufficient breeding stock here in West Virginia that would have met those same, uh, you know, growth patterns and so on, which I assume is what we're talking about here. So what did you bring into West Virginia here that wasn't already here? Well, the genetics that are coming here are, these are express genetics. And I'm not saying that there isn't a cow or two or, or, or maybe even a hundred here in the state that have a little bit of the same breeding that some of these cows, if you go back, say if you go back five generations, you may find something there that would be in some of these cows. I'm not going to tell you that, that there's no cattle in West Virginia that does not have a little bit of these bloodlines in them someplace, but they're not going to be bred like these. Does that answer your question? I'm not really sure that it does because, again, we haven't addressed the question of what did you specifically bring into the state that's not here. It seems like you can't identify it. And part of what I'm concerned with is, and it was a question that was raised by Mr. Adele a little while ago, that there doesn't really seem to be a plan here. We're not sure. Maybe there's some cows here like this, maybe not. But we went off to Oklahoma and spent $33,000 on, on four cows. Now, another thing that I understand about this, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the uh, purchase actually was a cow-calf pair, with the, the calf being a bull calf. And if I understand, and I'm not in the, the, the business, I know you are, but um, I, I guess I have friends that are. Um, the number one thing you're really purchasing there is the bull. And this would be the first bull calf out of these cows. And so it, aren't these bulls unproven bulls at this point, whenever they're the first bull out of that particular cow? No, not when you go back and look at how they were bred. If these bulls, now let me correct, there's four cows and four kids, four bulls and one half group by their sides. And these bulls, if they would be an express sale, 
next year, if they, if they kept those cows and put those bulls in their state, their average last year was around 7,000 per head for their bulls. I understand and the, that. And these bulls are of that quality. Yeah. I understand that. I'm simply saying that at this point they're unproven. Well, I mean, they really do. My understanding of the way that process works, you can have the best breeding in the world, but until that bull breeds, it's an unproven bull. True. Okay. Uh, I know there's a lot of other people yeah. that have questions, and so I'll, I'll stop. Uh, we'll come back to you. I'm going to extend it. I mean, we don't have anybody in here afterwards. We'll extend for about 10 minutes or so in case there's questions for uh, Mr. Adele also. But I, I did see uh, Delegate Summers uh, follow up with uh, Delegate Howe. Thank you for your um, question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Keats, for being here. And as someone who uh, raises registered angle cattle and did, did look at the pedigree myself, I found that many, many of the genetics of this uh, purchase are in West Virginia. And I could probably list the farms for you if you needed me to. But what I'm concerned about is when you spoke on the radio on the Mike Queen Show and something that concerned and actually insulted the cattle farmers of this state, is you said that you intended to improve the genetics in this state. And, and we're asking you to explain to us how that was determined that the genetics in this state were not of the quality that you wanted. So, so I, looked at, I looked at your purchase, and it's okay. Um, but I'm concerned that only three of these 28 quality indicators, and, and we know we're talking about EPDs, but I know the committee doesn't understand that, that farm lingo. But there's only three of these indicators in the top 5%, and in fact, 25% of them are in the bottom of the quality indicators. So I, I, I just don't see where this, this purchase was any better than the genetics that we have in our state. And, and I did read that she didn't calve till 28 months. She, I would have called that her out of my herd to start with. If she couldn't produce by two, 24, 25 months, she didn't even have her first calf till she was 28 months. So I am concerned looking at the pedigree information and your comments saying that you wanted to sell the embryos and the bulls. Now, if that outrage from the local farmers has caused you to change your plan, I'm, I'm pleased with that, I'm glad. I, I'm glad to hear you tell me you don't think you're gonna compete in the performance test. Is that, is that what you're saying now? If that is the will of the of the farmers in this state, I'm sure that we, we would not put those in those performance tests. Well I feel that we're competing against them. I, 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 I very much appreciate that because there are a limited number of slots in those performance tests and if the state took one that would be one less that my farm or anyone else's farm could participate in. So I, I'm very pleased to hear that you have rethought that. What about the sales of the embryos? Actually uh, I doubt if we will offer, I may have, you may have misunderstood me when I was on the radio, but I meant that we were going to put those embryos in our commercial cows and then those offspring would be offered for sale, which it would still be an embryo, only if only a developer. I, I understand that, but if you're going to sell that cow, then you're competing with the farmers in the state. And actually, I find it a little bit ironic. It's their taxpayer dollars that they're now competing with because you're going to, the state's going to be selling selling cattle and so am i so we're creating a competition it is the concern of many of the farmers who have reached out to me that they don't want to compete with the state with their tax dollars if that's going to be a concern we will not do that further I, i'm very pleased to hear that today and i appreciate that thank you uh, delegate how thank you mr chairman uh, you're, you're telling me, it, uh, if I understood correctly, you're working on a plan now to how, how to utilize the, the cows that were purchased. Is that correct? Well, we know how we're going to use the cows. We're going to flush those, put those are in embryos in our commercial herds. And then, from what I understand, you do not want us to put them in any performance testing programs to see how they're going. So, to me, that is kind of a hindrance because the people in this state are not going to know if we if our genetics are better or worse than any, anybody else's but we will do the program with the people uh say the veterans people wanted to get into farmers i mean into farming lease those cattle to them now we will retain ownership of those cows whatever we lease to them for a dollar now all the offspring that comes from those cattle they will keep but when the when the lease is up or when they uh, Get the, uh, we get take the cows back, then we can sell those cows to recoup our money that we've put in. 
my, part of the lease agreement. My question is, uh, why was this plan not put out ahead of time before you purchased the cattle to get public input? I guess uh, I didn't know that we needed to put that out for public input. I will say this. I did talk it over with Mr. Odell when he worked for the department. And he said that he had wanted to do, to do a program like that for years, but he never had the opportunity. Okay. Uh, also, you stated that you didn't have to go through the state's purchasing program to do this because I know anything over twenty-five thousand dollars has put out competitive. We have an exemption here. We'll leave this with you. Okay, I appreciate it because I couldn't find it. Uh, but being with the uh, some information from the delegate here that you know a lot of these bloodlines apparently are already in West Virginia. And that would we have been better off the taxpayers had we put this out for a bid, saying we are looking for these specifications and allow a competitive bid process? Actually, you can't bid any of that. That's pretty hard to do. Ten numbers, but not for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, further questions of either of our presenters uh, or Mr. O'Dell? Uh, one final question, uh, Delegate Bobby. Oh, I'm sorry, if there may be another one. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the last term that you used, Phenia type? Yes. Okay. Now, that is what the animal looks like. When you walk up and look at an animal, she has correct muscle structure, you know, she's a good square head. You know, her, her <coughs> overall makeup is what that is. You can't actually bid on that because uh, unless you went to everybody and looked at every animal, you know, that would be the only way you could do it. And, and when you bid, you know, <coughs> Just say, Dolly Karen, she had she wanted to put a meat in. She puts her meat in on those animals, and we mostly have to accept the lowest bid. Not necessarily, but usually that's the way it goes. So you actually don't know for sure what you're getting until after you've accepted the bid. Mm, so, so um, when you're almost a joke, like when you went to, did you go to Oklahoma home and look at these, or did you find them on eBay, or how? I went to the sale and bought them at the sale. You went to Oklahoma. I basically looked at them before we bought. Yes. Okay, you went to the sale, and you went to only to Oklahoma. Yes. Okay. Is only because it is the top sale in the country. That's the reason. Okay. All right, and and then was there a bid process, or you just offered an amount? For the for the cow, they were all offered a public auction. There was five hundred so bidders. Okay, and were these the only ones you bid on? No, I bid on a couple others that went higher than what I wanted to pay for. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator Carr. Did you have one last question? Just related to this particular. Uh, Seller, have you ever done business with your particular seller before? Actually, I have. Yes. As the state, or as Mike Teets, or as Mike Teets, Teets Farms. <laughs> when I before I ever came to work for the department. Okay. And, and did that, in one manner or another, lead you back to them uh, on behalf of the state? Then. Well, it led me back there because of the quality that they had. Okay. One of the things that. And I, I'm not going to dwell on this really long, but I just keep I keep hearing. And of course, Delegate Summers has much more in-depth knowledge than I do related to this. But it seems like we keep hearing about the quality and quality, but there doesn't really seem to be any quantifiable way to determine what that actually was and, and why this quality is in some way better than anything that could be found around here. I, I, I really wonder why we're going to Oklahoma to buy this stuff, even if it were justified, which. I'm not sure that it is because it seems like the plan we have is sort of just a sort of a vague notion of hey, why don't we get buy some cows and rent them out? Well, I think the best way for me to answer that for you is for me to give you the the record, CDDs and everything of all four animals, and you can sit down with the nugget here and you all go over them and give me your opinion. Well, I, I like think it's going to be hard to find records. We'll make a formal request that you provide that to the committee, and then okay. we'll provide it to all the members. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you.